I'm going to mash a button here and we'll bring Christina on screen with us. And uh, Christina, you're going to be live on OPN in just a second. So let's hope this works. Ta da! So, ladies and gentlemen, I want to welcome to OPN tonight Christina Keebler. She is the founder and producer and writer of RuralSpin.com, and we're very fortunate to have have her with us tonight. She's coming to us live from somewhere in Colorado that she'll uh, tell us a little bit more about. And um, Christina, if you want to say hi to the people, I just want to make sure they can hear you. Hello, everyone, and Mark, thank you very much for having me. Okay, so clearly does that look and sound good before I launch in? Because I may say something incredibly profound, and I don't want anybody to miss it. Okay, we're good to go. So welcome, Christina. Thank you for your patience. Um, she's been in the green room while the uh, pre-show was playing, and I hope you guys enjoyed that. Um, Christina is an anthropologist, gardener, botanist, and ecologist, and that doesn't begin to scratch the surface of all the things she does. Uh, she's going to tell us a little bit more about that. Um, she blogs about sustainable skills on RuralSpin.com and has a very active uh, RuralSpin Facebook page, which uh, we do have a pad, and clearly you'll put that pad uh, address up at some point. We'll share that out with everybody, and there it is. So welcome, Christina. Thank you for joining us tonight. Thank you very much for having me. I appreciate it. And before we get too far into it, why don't you tell us where you are in Colorado and what the weather report is this evening? Well, <laughs> um, I, I'm uh, north of Boulder, about 30 minutes north of Boulder, Colorado, which is more, more people probably be aware of kind of where that's at, about uh, 45 minutes north of Denver, on the Front Range. It's, um, now the weather the past couple of days has been kind of crappy. It's been pretty snowy late in the season, and I'm not sure what the weather report is because, frankly, I don't really check those things. <laughs> you know, I know I, I should I'm obsess about the weather like everyone else, but I woke up this morning. I'm like, oh, it's snowing again. <laughs> I had no idea. So, um, and I, I'm not sure what it's going to do tomorrow. I think it's supposed to get sunny again. Yep. It's typical spring in our mountains, too. You know, it'll be 70 degrees this afternoon, and we'll wake up with six inches of snow in the morning. You just never know. So I miss these last gasps of spring. But it's a perfect time to have you on. Why don't you introduce yourself a little bit better than I did and tell us about your background, your education, your experiences, your interests, and uh, just kind of give us a snapshot of who you are and where you are at this point in your life. Wow, that's, that's not a very big question, is it? <laughs> um, I guess who I am as a person is basically someone who really likes to learn about a lot of different things. Um, and because of that, I, I, my life has sort of been set up as a combination of doing something, then going to school, then doing something, then going to school, then doing something, then going to school. Because I get, I get involved with different interests and they, they lead me on a path and I tend to follow them and you know through the years I started out as a horticulturist and a professional gardener at the Chicago Botanic Garden and then I got interested in natural uh, plants and, and native prairies and then went back to school and got a degree in, in botany and worked as a field botanist for a while and then I got interested in this the juxtaposition between uh, botany and the natural world and how people interact with it. So then I went back to school and I got this degree in anthropology. So, you know, for me, everything I've done has sort of led up to uh, where I'm at now. And, and you know, during that time period, I've, I've written, um, I was an editor at Mother Earth News Magazine for a while. Um, you know, all those things to me are, they work together to allow me to communicate how I, at least how I think we as human beings can, you know, work within the environment that we have and be more so self-sufficient and kind of kinder to the environment in general, and just as a society, how we can do that. And it's been fun. I I I like everything I've done. I don't regret anything. Um, I was really excited when you told me you were an anthropologist because every anthropologist that I've ever met personally has been an awesome person and fabulously interesting and, and you absolutely have con continued that standard. So um, I love how the things you do all tie in 
to the human experience. Um, and I'm looking forward to you telling us a little bit about that. So I guess the first question I have is um, why rural spin? What prompted you to start that? And you, I mean, you have a pretty active presence on the web. Um, and so what, what stimulated that? Uh, it, was, it was actually several different friends who kind of prompted me to, to take my interest in the things that I do and make it more of a public kind of educational endeavor. Um, you know, one driving force was a friend of mine, his name is Tom Shaka, and he owns a company called Camping Survival, and, um, you know, we, we kind of met through Facebook, and I started identifying plants for him just because I'm interested in it. And um, this is this is my dog River, by the way. <laughs> Hello, uh, River. Yes, very cute. Uh, so, and he's always been very supportive of of what I know and my knowledge base, and has um, you know through the years prompted me to make it available to the general public. And another friend of mine, her name is Leslie Hatch. Uh, she's a high school friend. Um, <laughs> She, she this is actually the one who came up with the name Rural Spin <laughs> River, and um, so I just started the the blog, you know, based upon the faith people had in me, and and uh, the information I was sharing with them, and it just grew. You know, the Facebook page grew, the blog has grown. I now have an Etsy store where I make things and, and sell them, and uh, you know, look for vintage linens and a whole variety of things. So it's it's really uh, grown, and um, you know, I started teaching classes at a local farm called the Lions Farmette. So it's it's exciting, and it's all been a lot of fun. But it's not just me doing it; it's a lot of people encouraging me and uh, having faith in me. Otherwise, I, I probably wouldn't be doing it. Right. Well, um, it obviously once I started, you know, I just stumbled onto it, you know, some months ago. I started following it and reading it, and it's quite obvious you you put a a, a big amount of work into it, and the um, the writing is so it's pleasant. I love to read it in the evening. It makes me feel better about the world, and and also very useful. And it's odd because a lot of the things you talk about is the way I I grew up, and. Um, I want to get a shout out to my mom. My 80 year old mother is on live stream tonight watching the show. She's very excited that, that you were on tonight. And uh, so I grew up in a family that, you know, we, we grew huge gardens, we freeze, we canned, we, you know, raised our own cows and chickens and, you know, butchered them and froze them and all that. So um, those skills are not unfamiliar to me, but as I reflect upon it, you know, I don't know that I could still do that. Um, right. There would have to be some relearning. And what you're providing to all of us and anybody that watches your your uh, sites is you're teaching these skill sets. So, what are your your particular areas of interest on rural spin? Do you just like cover everything that comes down the pike, or do you have several different areas you like to focus on? <coughs> That's a that's a good question. I I would love to cover everything, you know, but I I'm not that bright, so, so I can't I can't do that. But I do I do try to provide things for um, you know folks who are more interested in things like building and solar energy, and because I'm not I'm not MacGyver, I'm not mechanically inclined, I'm more of a creative kind of person. But you know, I try to provide resources that um, get everyone's attention in terms of living off the grid, being more sustainable and self-sufficient. For, for me personally, uh, cooking is a huge thing for me, as is gardening and canning and river. I don't know if this is going to work. <laughs> <laughs> um, and uh, canning, cooking, uh, I weave as well. And, um, you know, I sew. I do a lot of these, you know, what are typically thought of as traditional you know, women's roles, even though weaving is actually worldwide, it's more of a male dominated uh, activity and always have been, which most people don't realize. But um, I, you know, I, I was probably born about 150 years too late <laughs> with everything I like, I like to do. 
Um, but you know, you brought up an interesting point that as a society, at least in Western society in this country and other Western countries, we've we've kind of lost a lot of knowledge even within just a generation or two. Um, you know, one thing I really love to do is I'll post recipes from old cookbooks that I have because I have a pretty big collection of of old cookbooks. And some people, you know, they sort of get offended when I do this because the recipes are so vague. You know, it'll say, you know, add, you know, gravy, but it won't say which kind, how much, you know, because people used to just know that kind of knowledge. So um, it's sort of interesting that, you know, even just recipes, people are, you know, unless they know how many teaspoons, you know, we don't know how to cook anymore, almost. Um, you know, and, and I recognize that people don't have time to cook from scratch anymore. So what I try to do is, um, you know, give, give some of these recipes and, and different techniques as a form of fun, but also try to teach people how to do some things by themselves, um, because I think it's really important for memory. Um, you know, I think we all have fond childhood memories of you know, I remember when my grandma baked this for me or my mother cooked this dish for me. But, you know, what are what are kids now going to think? I remember when, when my parents nuked popcorn for me. You know, no one's going to remember that. <laughs> um, but they might remember, you know, my mom, she always, on my birthday, she always made from scratch this cookie. You know, that kind of thing. Even if it's just one thing, it's better than nothing. <laughs> right. Um... Why don't you, can you give us a couple of examples of the kind of content that you provide on your blog and the, the stuff you talk about on your Facebook pages for people that are new to those sites? Sure. Um, I will cover a variety of things. I try to cover things like plant identification for wild edible plants, like for folks who are interested in bushcrafting and also as a you know, just a way to let people know, look, you know, there's there's actually food growing in your lawn as long as you don't spray your lawn with pesticides and herbicides. But um, you can go out there and dandelions are darn tasty and you can cook with the flowers and the leaves. You know, or uh, there's a weed called, you know, plantain that you can actually make a really good medicinal salt from if you know how to do it. So I have articles on my blog, um, you know, about things like harvesting uh, milkweed flower buds and making them into a really yummy risotto. Um, and then I have, you know, the blog post I posted today was an article on uh, ditching coffee for, for cocoa in the morning and the 10 health reasons that you'd want to do that, um, besides the fact that I think it tastes better. <laughs> um, but for that, you know, I looked at actual scientific studies to write that article, and I provided links to the original sources for it. So it's a way for people to, you know, you know, I think people should be skeptical when they read things. I think they should go and find out if something's actually true or not, based upon real knowledge, not what, just some, not what I say. Don't believe me. <laughs> you know? yeah. So, so it, it's nice if you know if, if people have original sources to go through. So I try to provide a combination of. A, a variety of things. You know, there's a post on there on how to build a raised bed. There's there's posts even on, on historic things. You know, one of my most popular posts was this old photograph of a kitchen from you know, like 1940s Dust Bowl, and that both on Facebook and on the blog got a lot of discussion from people because it taps into people's memories mm -hmm. and and their idea of home and what home means. Right. So, the the I I know what picture and I was actually running your photo loops here for a little bit while you were talking and I'll I'll put that back up again but that picture is in those photo loops and and you're right it it, it gives a visual imagery of what people perceive as home and it's very very powerful. Um, what are your sources and points of departure? for the things you're exploring. I know we talked briefly in some emails about your, your love of old cookbooks, but um, 
How do you come up with an idea for a posting, or, and what's your source material for that? The ideas, um, they just pop into my head. I don't know where they come from. And I, I have such a long list of things that I want to write about and videos that I want to make, because uh, I'm way behind on the, my videos. Um, you know, I'll be doing this till I die, basically, which is fine with me. Um, but sometimes it's just, you know, I get an idea based upon a comment that someone will make in, on the Facebook page. Um, you know, someone will say something like, you know, I wish I, wish I, I um, knew if, if there really was four teaspoons in a tablespoon. You know, so then I'll think, oh, well, I should write a blog post on measuring. You know, and just all of measuring, not not just volumes, but also weights and how they interact, and you know the the role that temperature plays on how much flour you need to use in a recipe because it can vary greatly. Mm -hmm. So then it you know, someone will say something, and then it'll just turn into this huge thing in my head, and then I'll have to, you know, it's almost like an obsession. Yeah. You know, then I have to research it and find out everything about it that I can, and then I'll write a post on it. So. You know, it comes from, uh, you know, other people, and just if I'm reading a book, but it, it never stops. It's always, I'm always thinking about that. It's it's a blessing and a curse, isn't it? <laughs> because, yeah. because it never stops. I know, I know the feeling. Um, I I would love for you to give people a sense of your your methodology, and we we spoke about this some. Um, and um, I'm dying for you to tell the canned bacon story because that just, to me, that just like encapsulates how much work goes into something like this because it's too easy to assume, oh, this person has some knowledge and they sit down and in 10 minutes write this blog and we all benefit and la dee da. But there's a lot of work that goes into this. So let's, let's hear a story about how, how things happen. Okay. Uh, the, the canned bacon story is that, you know, that's, that's a good summary of how I go about things. <clears throat> and um, my friend Tom at Camping Survival, he sells canned bacon. It's not it's not mine by any stretch, but it's cans of bacon that you can get in case the emergency, you know, the electricity goes out or something like that. And he had sent me a can of this stuff, and it was okay, but I thought, you know, I can do better than this. So then I started doing research on canned bacon. You know, at first I want to say that, you know, the official word from the um, Institute on Canning through the, um, I don't know if it's the FDA or the, or who kind of governs that, is that, you, you know, canning bacon is not supposed to be good, but so many people do it, so, you know, do it at your own risk, <laughs> well, is my legal caveat for that. But I went on YouTube, which, of course, there's a million and one, you, you know, videos on YouTube about everything that you can possibly imagine. Most of them are not good resources. There's some fabulous ones on there, but you know it's almost a crapshoot. You really gotta almost be pre-knowledgeable before you go in there and try to learn something. So I, I looked at as many videos on canning bacon, bacon as I could, and all of them had them canning the bacon while it was uncooked. And some of these videos are pretty funny, you know, just you know, cigarettes burning in the background and bottles of Jack Daniels. And, I, you know, I love Jack Daniels. I have nothing against Jack Daniels. But it just, it was just a fun experience going through all these videos. So I tried that method, and I hated it. Um, you know, the bacon, after it was canned, it just kind of came out of the jar like slop, and it was gross, and I didn't even want to cook it. Um, so I decided to scrap all of it and start over. So... Through about a month or two months, I would regularly buy pounds of bacon at the grocery store, and I'd bring them home, and I started experimenting. And finally, 30 pounds of bacon later, you know, I had what I thought was a good series of recipes for canned bacon. And not only was it just canned bacon, it was flavored canned bacon. So I have like a Tabasco flavor, a maple flavor. Um, you know, plain, you know, a recipe for bacon bits, so it, it turned into this whole wonderful thing, and this stuff is so good, you know, people ask me about the shelf life, I'm like, it's bacon, you know, it's really good bacon, there is no shelf life, we're going to eat it, <laughs> you can even, you know, blink an eye, it'll be gone, yeah. so. But, and so, just roughly, what, what was the length of that evolution? 
from from idea to finished published uh, blog posting. It was probably about three months. Three months of work to get down to one base recipe that you could use with some variations on the theme. Yeah, one blog post. Yeah. It's an incredible effort, and as I understand it, a whole lot of what you do runs about that same course. I mean, you do a thorough amount of research and background investigation, so, um, you know, everything's well documented. Um, somebody's asking already, do you have a still in the yard? <laughs> you know, that's a great question, because that's one of the things I'm researching. <laughs> um, when I was an editor of Mother Earth News, I... I started to look into distilling um, because there's, you know, there's serious legal issues involved with that. Right. Um, they did make some connections with some distillers out east, and um, you know, I am. That is one of the things I'm interested in. You know, my interest is more distilling uh, lavender <laughs> water and things like that. Right. But, um, but yes. That 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 is something I'm looking at, and uh, you know, I, you know, I try to share what I can online. I have posted a distilling types of apparatus and, ar and articles on the Facebook page in the past. Great, and and just for the people that are watching, you know, distilling is not limited limited to fermented beverages. Though you know, there's right. nothing wrong with that. But um, I actually have a neighbor that distills tinctures, you know, herbal tinctures for medicinal uses. Um, so there's, it's a whole science in and of itself. Um, do, you, do you live off the grid? And if you don't, do you have an inclination to do so? I, I do not. And um, yes, I do have a, a huge inclination to do so. Um, it's something I think about daily. And every day I'll go and I'll look for land. <laughs> you know, I'll just, and sometimes I'll post land listings that I find or property listings that I think someone really needs to have, I'll post them on Facebook. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're in Idaho or, you know, if you're in Illinois, check check out this property. Um, you know, that I, yeah, it's something I definitely want to do for a variety of reasons. And, uh, you know, it, it's all about time and, and work and, and, of course, money. You know, I don't, when I buy land, I want to pay cash for it. You know, who knows how old I'll be when that when that happens. But it's it's I'm always working towards it, and I think that's the secret is that if you have any kind of goal, you know, you have to work at it daily, even if it's just the tiniest little steps. Um, you know, even if it's just throwing a quarter in a jar. You know, that's better than not doing anything. And eventually, those quarters add up. Um, you, you know, I think that's a good point, and it kind of wasn't on my list to talk about, but the, the work ethic involved in, you know, being self-sustainable, you know, living off the grid, or if you're not off the grid, at least working towards sustainable goals. It takes it takes an amount of focus and energy, which, which doesn't mean it can't be fun and enjoyable, but it just doesn't happen instantly. It, it doesn't, and you know, part of that work is a dedication to your belief system and, you know, what the things that you think are important, even if they go against, you know, what your friends and family think and what they do. You know, I've never had anyone judge me negatively for any, for my desire to live off-grid or anything like that. Um, but, it, you know, when you're going against society or, you know, when you're going against the norm, it can get a little tiring, especially if you're kind of trying to do it alone. So, you know, that's kind of part of the work is is just kind of sticking to your guns and your belief system and, you know, going toward the direction that you want to live a more sustainable, kinder, you know, life. But the other thing is that even though a lot of this takes work, it, to me, it makes things much simpler. Um, there's nothing wrong and in fact, there's a lot of benefit, I think, with taking the laundry and throwing it on the line instead of putting it in the dryer. You know, it's a little, it takes longer to do it. And, you know, if it rains on your clothes or something, that's a, kind of a pain in the ass. But, but in, at the end of the day, it's just this very meditative, wonderful type of activity. You know, I don't, I don't watch TV. You know, I have one and I watch movies, but it's not connected 
to TV per se. Um, so a lot of my time is spent doing these activities that even though some people might consider them to be work, you know, to me they're relaxing and they're enjoyable. Um, but, but that's just me. You know, I know there's a, there's a lot of different people in the world and everyone's different, you know, and I respect all of that. You know, part of that's from the anthropology piece. Right. <laughs> but, um, you know, work does not necessarily equal drudgery. You know, work can be a wonderful, peaceful, rewarding thing. Right. Uh, um, I, I have an older friend that lives off the grid. He, he's the fellow that does the tinctures, and he's the most... Um, I've met three people in my life, which encompasses a lot of people, that I think sort of have it figured out, and he's one of them. And he's at such ease and peace, but he, he, he has a grueling life, you know, living up on the side of that mountain. He's done it for 40 years, and he's getting older, and he's you know, arthritic and all that, but he is the most happy and content person you'd ever meet. And I, I had a conversation with him once about, you know, work and all that and he said well he said his definition of work is anything you're doing when you'd rather be doing something else and I don't do that you know he gardens he builds he works the you know in his apothecary and he puts in a full day but to him it's it's life sustaining and energizing much like I think what you're saying yeah without a doubt um I wanted to take a little segue, and I didn't write the quote down, but on your Facebook page, uh, on the About page, you speak briefly to the issue of um, politics and opinions and stuff, and you just touched on that. And in just a moment ago, you mentioned you know some some kindness and gentleness in the world, which we could use a little bit more of. So. I would kind of like to visit that that quote you have on your Facebook page. Um, I don't know if you recall it off the top of your head, but just kind of your position on you know the politics and opinions and all that kind of thing. Well, I, I know that I can't remember the direct quote. I, I wrote it a year ago, right. but I know I know what you're referring to. Um, you know, the, the idea is that this idea of of being self-sufficient and living off grid and um, you know kind of being responsible for your own livelihood and your own way of life in your home and things, things like that. You know, there's people who are very liberal who believe that, and there's people who are very conservative in their politics who believe that. So, you know, in a way, this is the issue where we actually do kind of come together. You know, people who kind of have this belief system, it doesn't matter who they vote for, they all basically kind of believe the same type of thing, you know, they, they come at it from different directions, but, um, so, and I, I know for a fact that there's people on the Facebook page that if, if, you know, if they knew who the other person voted for, they would probably dislike each other, but because of the, the, the because of the way the page is run, that's never really brought up, so we all get along fine, and we share knowledge and respect each other, and, you know, I don't, I don't have ever a problem you know, with I never have to ban anyone because no one's mean, no one's a jerk, no one's saying nasty things about anyone, and um, and it's kind of refreshing right, <laughs> to right. have a Facebook, you know, a page on Facebook where people don't have to worry about that. It's like a safe. I like to think of it as a safe place for people to go to share knowledge without having to worry about you know being disrespected for their belief system. And I, I'm really sensitive to that because we try to do the same thing here for the same reasons, like, you know, to connect via our commonalities and common interests. And so um, we are fortunate. I mean, it works much like your, your page does. And I just wanted to get, get that out because the, the world in general is getting to be such a, such a tough place, you know, that I think every chance we get just point to the good and speak to the good of it and the good in people uh, that we ought to and I just wanted to throw that in. Um, why don't you tell us a little bit about Rural Spin World Headquarters, you know, what's, what's, your, what's your, your, your home or homestead, however you want to characterize it, what's, what's that like, is it, in a, is it in the country, is it in suburban area, urban area, just kind of give us a snapshot 
of, of your place there so we know what's coming from the laboratory. Yeah, I, you know, when I moved here from Kansas about a year and a half ago, and, um, you know, originally I wanted to buy land and whatnot, but, um, you know, through a, you know, I'll kind of spare you a lot, we don't have enough time to talk about all of it, but basically I ended up in a wonderful neighborhood. It's a, the house was built, you know, 1880, you know, the first section of the house was an old log cabin. You know, of course, they built onto it through the years, and right now my, my house is about 850 square feet, so it's pretty small, um, but it had a big yard in the back, and there was nothing in the backyard. It was a blank, there was a sidewalk and a garage in the back, and then lawn, and I use that, put it in quotes, because it's semi-arid environment, there's no irrigation system. Right. So, you know, I thought, I can build a little urban homestead back here. You know, so I, I put an eight-foot fence around the whole thing so no one could complain about what I was doing. And, um, and it, you know, I installed and built raised beds. Um, I designed a chicken coop and built that last uh, spring. You know, I've got uh, hens, five hens, you know, one of whom is blind, Ginger, which is kind of famous on the site. <coughs> Um, and my raised beds are, are built like mini greenhouses. So, you know, two of them are planted now, and they're and they're tented with six milliliter plastic sheeting uh, to protect them from this freaky weather that we're having. Um, so I, I'm developing a small orchard back there. You know, I'll be able. You know, and I'm going to add shrubs, currants, so I can can currants and some Nanking cherries. And there's a sour cherry tree on the side, you know, I mean, it, you can do so much with a small piece of land, you know, with just some some knowledge about what to do, and most people don't don't know, especially if they live in suburbs. You know, of course, there's challenges now with um, growing food in your backyard, and, and even putting up a clothesline, um, you know, different homeowners associations that prohibit that kind of thing, it's kind of ridiculous. <laughs> But uh, the neighborhood I live in is an older neighborhood, and you know we just got a chicken law two years ago. But everyone should check. You know, even the city of Chicago allows you to have chickens in your backyard. Actually, the city of Chicago allows you to have roosters. Really? So what? What is a chicken law for people who don't know? Is it a for or against? Uh, a chicken. You know, I'm not even sure if that's a technical term for it. It's a great law, term. I love it. <laughs> um. You know, a lot of cities are allowing people to have a small flock of urban hens. You know, usually roosters are outlawed. Um, and, and you are allowed to have, you know, four or five chickens in your backyard to supply eggs mm -hmm. to your home. And I, you know, I have enough eggs with my five hens to supply two households with eggs. And they're really awesome eggs. You know, the yolks are orange because they're so wonderful. Um, and they're entertaining. There's nothing funnier than you know leaving your house in the morning and, and having a chicken just haul, <laughs> run towards you because they think you got something. You know they're just so funny and entertaining to have. Um, so that's what I mean by chicken laws. And a lot of cities are starting to allow people to have their own little domestic and urban flocks. Uh, but everyone should check and see what the laws are in in your town and. If they don't currently have a chicken law, you know, propose one because their chickens are good. Yeah, and you know, we could we could make T-shirts with Ginger's image on it. it. Says, "Be a rebel, have a chicken," <laughs> or something, <laughs> something like that. That would be great. Um, you you mentioned you you had a like a small yard. What it what is small? Like, give us a sense of the size. Oh gosh. Like a quarter acre, two acres. No, you know, it's. You know, I'm, I'm hundred feet. <laughs> spatial. Um, it's probably a C. I don't. I. Uh, it's. Uh, I have the foggiest idea. It's. I think it's a good size. I just. You know, I would say something, and it could be five hundred feet off. Spatially, I'm not there. Right. So. Well, yeah. Uh, so, would you say just a just a average town sized backyard? Yes, just an average. Okay. There's extra huge about this yard. It's just an average suburban yeah. yard. The I, difference in my house is 
850 square feet. My house is small. Right. The reason I ask that is because a lot of the viewers are, live in urban or suburban areas, uh, which we're going to get into, you know, this, this whole idea of transferable information in a minute. But that you can, in fact, you can feed a family off a very small lot. For, uh -huh. a, for if not year round for a good part of the year and the yeah. thing you say with the chickens like a couple of chickens you'll have more eggs than you ever know what to do with yeah, and so, I had eggs all winter yeah. you know I mean it tapers off in the winter but they never stop laying yeah. now um, I want to talk a little bit about um, your other endeavor then we'll come back to the rural spin stuff but it's important for for me to make the point that, you know, as delightful as it might be, you don't just wander around barefooted at your place, you know, in gingham jumpers doing the whole rural spin thing 24-7. You, you do work, you have a business that is, you know, separate from that. So can you give us a, a, just a glimpse of your professional life and how do you integrate the two? Um, yeah, I'm not independently wealthy. <laughs> Yeah, no one is taking care of me. I pay my own mortgage and, you know, and all that. So I do, you know, I do work for money. I don't make any money from rural spend. You know, I'm trying to get to that point. But, you know, since I started it, you know, I don't sell ads on my blog, none of that. And I don't want to. I think I'll kind of, I don't, I don't want to do that. But um, I have a, a company called People Path LLC, and uh, my business partner Gavin Johnston and I are both cultural anthropologists and we conduct research for different companies and organizations and um, you know do some social media work for small businesses as well so um, you know we are self-employed as anthropologists so it does allow us to have a little more control over how we schedule our time you know I, I'm lucky and I know this that I don't have to get up at 6 a.m. to be at a job by 8 and work 12 hours there and then come home and just feel like I need to drop that. Um, you know, I've, I've done that. I've worked for corporations before and it's a very grueling, for me, it's a very, some people thrive on it. I was not one of those people. Um, <clears throat> but I still, I work a lot with people path and then also with rural spin. So I'm working all the time, but it's different when you're working for yourself. Right. Um, and when I'm working on a research project, it does take a lot of time. So, and, and fans of rural spin have noticed that there have been times where I don't make posts. And at, you know, those times where I'm not making posts, it means I'm, I'm trying to earn some money to sustain rural spin. Right. Well, I mean, I think it's important because a challenge a lot of us have is how to incorporate some of these things you're talking about into our daily lives because, you know, some people do have that 12-hour grueling task and, you know, I have a day job too and it's like trying to cram everything in and, and mine is, is a little bit more benign than most. Uh, and in fact, I think I'm probably fundamentally unemployable out in the world anymore but <laughs> um, because I live in a very rural area. So it has a different pacing and everything. But um, one of the things I want to leave all the viewers with tonight is that some of the stuff you're talking about, you know, everybody can do, even in little bits. And you, you don't, like, you don't need to buy a farm. You don't need, but you can do some of these little things. So I want to, you know, keep making that point tonight. Um, how does your background as an anthropologist inform the work on rural spin? That's a good question. You know, I would say it, it informs it in several different ways. You know, one, um, you know, anthropology, in my opinion, more than anything else, is a is a, a training you how to look at the world in a specific kind of way. Where, um, you know, to be a good anthropologist, you have to have the ability to kind of remove temporarily your own belief system and really try to understand someone else's belief system and where they're coming from and how they function in the world. You know, as anthropologists, our job, cultural anthropologists, is to understand what people do and kind of why they're doing it. And you can't really do that if, you know, you're looking at it through a, a, a filter of judgment. 
Um, so when you remove that filter, you know, it, it allows me to, and other anthropologists as well, to look at all kinds of different people, you know, what, what they're doing and why they're doing it, and then, you know, kind of knit, knit the reality in with the, this ideal of a self-sufficient way to live. Um, because it's not, you know, it's not as easy as just quitting a job and buying some land and building a straw bale house, you know, and you know, some people talk about it like, why aren't you doing this? You know, it's your choice. Well, it's not, <laughs> it's a lot more complicated than that. So, you know, that's one thing that being an anthropologist, I think, gives me is this, I, I like to think of it as a certain amount of understanding that, you know, I, I can do this stuff that other people can't and they may not even want to, and that's awesome. Yeah. Um, the other thing is that it, it taught me how to do research, and I, I love doing research. You know, to me, it's a hobby. You know, like other people go play golf. I like to do research. So, um, and I know where to go for information to try to, tr try to tease out the truth. Um, and I also make sure that I look at a whole array of sources. I don't look at just one type of source. You know, I want to find out what everyone thinks. Know, and, and try to find out the truth through it all. So, it, I mean, those are the main ways that anthropology is a, is a benefit. But also, it, you know, I, I, I know what people around the world are doing in different arenas, you know, how they cook, how they make clothing, you know, what they do to heal themselves. Um, so just some raw cultural knowledge about what other cultures around the world are, are doing um, is a huge benefit as well. I, I love that uh, about, you know, being able to, you know, come to a project or an idea without preconceptions because of your training as an anthropologist. You have to not have the filters or else the data is skewed. So you, you absorb it and analyze it for what it is. And uh, I can see where that would be extremely helpful, like you were saying earlier, watching the videos. and. You, you can go, you can look at the videos and distill the information and go, well, you know, that's kind of bogus <laughs> because you're not predisposed to, to one, one belief system or another. So um, that was, was a wonderful answer. If you guys hear like something that's beating on the door, it's because one of my cats wants in because he <laughs> normally sleeps in this room. So I apologize for that. He's usually a little more patient. Um, what I'd like to do. Is is have you give us an example of man? Is that bothering you guys? Because he's about to make me crazy. No, um, the, hear it, but yeah, okay. I'll try to ignore it. Um, an example of a skill, you know, your choice, and I I want you to to illustrate to us how that skill is applicable or transferable across you know, demographic spectrums like it, if you're raising the chickens for example you can do it in your area can somebody do that in a city which you touched on but a lot of people when we're talking about shows like this or skills like this they go oh well I could never do that because I live in an apartment and blah 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 so maybe see if you can sort out that relationship for us by example. Okay. I, I can think of two off the top of my head. Um, you know, one thing that everyone can do really easily, and it's kind of a simple example, but very rewarding, and it also happens to be probably the most popular blog and point of discussion on Rural Spin, which is sourdough. And, um, you know, you, you can eliminate your need for store-bought yeast. Um, and it's very easy to do when you can make awesome bread, biscuits, and all manner of baked goods with wild collected sourdough starter that you make yourself. Um, you know, I have blog posts written on this, but and also videos on the topic. But all you do basically is mix flour and water, whip it with a fork, and you leave it sit. You know, basically it's just a trap for the wild yeast that is hanging around in the air. So, and that's, that's true no matter where, what part of the world you live in. You know, the kicker with that is that uh, all wild yeast is not created equal. 
So the wild yeast, and when I lived back in Kansas, it, it was uh, not a, very active, and it made great bagels and soft pretzels, but the bread was a little dense, right? Yes, it was dense. And um, here in Colorado, the wild yeast, is makes a wonderful light bread and biscuit, you know. So it's kind of a crapshoot, you know. And a lot of people all over the United States they'll send me notes about, um, you know, my bread is dense. What do I do? You know, if you use bread flour, that'll help. You know, so there's, but that's something that doesn't matter. You can live in, you know, downtown San Francisco and be doing the same thing that someone in the plains of South Dakota is doing. Right. The other example is gardening. Um, even if you just have an apartment, you can at least try to grow some herbs for your kitchen. You know, I have a window box in my kitchen. Um, I, I prefer it because uh, over having dried herbs um, because it's year-round. You know, I don't have to worry about harvesting the oregano and drying it for the season and all that. I just pluck it off the plant whenever I want it to cook with. Uh, and you can grow herbs indoors even with something just with a grow light if you don't have southern exposure. Um, you know, one of the biggest things I hear from people is I can't grow anything, I have a black thumb or whatever the case may be. But that's, that's not true. They just don't know, you know, they don't know some of the tricks. You know, the number one cause of death of houseplants is overwatering. You know, and most people, they water the stuff to death. And, um, you know, if most people backed off in the watering, they'd probably have no problem growing things. But that's something that you can do in an apartment. You don't need to have five acres of land to grow something for yourself. Any step that you can take to cut your need for a grocery store or to be able to grow your own is a step in the right direction. Yeah, and also I, I like, you know, the fact that it gives you a sense of accomplishment. That, that you are empowered and that you can in fact do if it may be this little thing but that's where stuff starts from right you, you find out oh I can grow my own parsley and make tabula or I can do whatever and the next thing is you'll try something else and try something else and this is how we start to address a lot of these problems and these issues that um, that are facing us today so for for all you guys that live in towns and cities and you say um, you can't can't do it then yes you can so I'm not I, we have somebody who's Lebanese descent saying I'm not pronouncing tabula right <laughs> but that's okay you can come on and pronounce it for us um, our culture and society is based on a consumption model especially in the United States so how do we shift our thinking to models of sustainability and what is the historical precedent and argument for sustainability? Well, um, I'll address the first question because that's first, which makes sense, I guess. You know, one, one thing that, um, and this is especially true in, in Western cultures, is that uh, advertising has sort of convinced people that they can't do it by themselves in a whole variety of ways. Um, and that's not true. You know, we used to do everything by ourselves and we did fine uh, without whatever product someone was trying to shill on us. Um, that's not to say that, you know, I'm anti products, because there's many things that are very beneficial, you know, like standardized medicines, you know, that, that don't kill you, that, you know, they don't have mercury in them, or whatever the case may be. So there's many things that are really great, but, um, you know, the role of, of companies is to make money for themselves. That's really it, you know, and it's, it's not, that's not a value judgment, that's just kind of a fact. So, um, you know, if, if people look at what they're buying a little more critically, you know, I think a lot of people would realize that, you know what, I don't need this electric coffee grinder. I can buy a manual coffee grinder that does just as well. And you know what, it'll never break down. I'll have this thing for the rest of my life. So I think 
the lesson with that is to buy wisely. You know, buy things that don't require electricity. Because there's, there's many things that you can purchase that, that do not need to be plugged in. The manual version works great of whatever, whatever it is. Um, and the second question of, you know, just the evidence of sustainability, you know, there's, there's cultures all over the world who, you know, live sustainable existences that are very happy. You know, and, stu and many studies have shown that in many ways those people are much happier than, than we are because their lives are simpler. You know, and that's the bottom line is that, you know, you remove all of the static from, uh, from life and the simpler the things become, the happier people become. Um, and, and that's kind of the core of rural spin is that, you know, you can, you can borrow things from the past, you know, methods, techniques, to make the modern world simpler. It doesn't mean we abandon it. You know, I have friends who kind of joke around with me that, you know, that I, you know, I want everyone to go back to the covered wagon, and that, you know, that's not really true. Um, you know, covered wagons were actually really uncomfortable to travel in. <laughs> they were very bumpy. They didn't have shocks back then. Um, they did, but they were leather strips, you know. So the idea is that we look to the past and also current cultures that, you know, live a, a simpler life, and we borrow from this and kind of reintroduce that simplicity back into our modern life. We keep what's great, you know, we kind of get rid of or decrease what, what makes things more difficult for us. Um, it, I love that simpler can, can and often does mean, mean happier. Uh, but you, it's a good point. You like the wagon's a good example. Like who, who wants to travel in that? You know, not me either. But there's probably better and more conscious ways to use our vehicles and our transportation than we do. You know, there's the a good result rests in the middle. We've gone too far to the the other extreme. But going all the way back to the beginning, maybe not the, the most uh, productive thing either. So I'm, I'm glad you pointed pointed out the need for balance. So um, just briefly, economics of sustainability is uh, making sustainable choices um, in this day and time when we're you know mired in capitalism um, is sustainability a wise economic choice for an individual well that's a that's a tough one um, I, well I think so you know I mean if you look at economics as more than just what happens to you as an individual uh, definitely mm -hmm. um, you know I had someone write a comment on the Facebook page the other day that you know they thought you know they're they're last year when they were trying to grow tomatoes that one of their tomatoes cost them $35. And I think there's actually a book that's called The $35 Tomato, you know, that someone had actually figured out the economics of, of how to do some of this stuff. Um, you know, so there's no doubt that, you know, if you're going to start gardening from scratch, having never done it before, and you don't have tools, you don't have um, a garden, a soil that's, that has ever been amended, you know, there's going to be some cash outlay, and you know what? It's it would be cheaper for you to just buy the tomatoes at the store. However, um, if you have ever grown your own tomatoes, you know that the tomatoes from the store are inedible compared to what you can grow yourself, even in just a container garden. Um, so, what is economics? Is it simply, you know? one penny in, one penny out? No, it's, it's not, you know, and, and if you if you look at all kinds of, uh, you know, scientific studies that have been done by economists, you know, there's all kinds of things that are involved with economics and, and what that what that term means. You know, we also get value from, uh, you know, a psychic connection, and I don't, I don't mean metaphysical, but, um, you know, this idea of Fresh, fresh water has value um, over dirty water. You know, even if they cost the same, 
there's health benefits in fresh water. Mm -hmm. You know, it tastes better. It's, it's more fun to drink. You know, whatever the case may be, you know, there, there's many things that are involved with wise economic choices that have nothing to do with m money. You know, money is, is sort of a made-up concept. It doesn't actually exist. You know, we're the ones who print the paper. We're the ones who say this dollar has this specific value. Right. You know, there's things that have actual value that's real, um, like a tomato that is a pleasure to eat off the vine. You know, you can't put a price tag on that. Right. Um, and I think that's a good point. It's like broadening the definition of economics to include all the elements. The, the water analogy was, was perfect. Um, so spring is eventually going to find its way to you. The snow is eventually going to melt. So why don't you tell us what kind of rural spin projects you have coming up in the near future? Oh Lord. Um, well, you know, I'm I'm itching to get into my garden. You know, I have I do have some things planted. You know, they're buried under snow at the moment underneath my mini greenhouse, radishes and arugula and leeks and kale and and uh, you know some other things, lettuce, spinach. I think that's about it. I planted a lot of leeks this year. I I love leeks. Um, you know, and, and corn. I'm doubling my corn crop because I grew this black Aztec uh, corn. And, um, you know, I, I ground it, dried it, um, I grew it, dried it, and then ground it into blue corn flour and made blue cornbread out of it. You know, I'll never go back because it was so good. So I doubled the amount of that I grew. Um, but I'm also, you know, on the hunt for vintage linens now. It's kind of the next thing I want to do. And also uh, soap making for sale. One big project I want to do is come up with a line of soaps that are, are more uh, medicinal, like soaps for insect repellent, soaps to wash your hair with, because um, I'm a big believer in not buying or not using commercial soaps. They have a lot of chemicals in them that cause irritation, and some of them are even, you're even carcinogens. Um, so soaps and the vintage linens, those are kind of my, you know, my next things that I'm, that I'm really excited about. So if the weather wasn't so bad, I'd be out getting more oil. So, but now I gotta wait. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's like you said earlier. There's always an idea or 50 waiting for you. So, it'll be fun to launch into it. So, for our final little bit, uh, one of the things I always ask our guests to do is to um, offer up a call to action for the viewers and listeners to um, help stimulate them. So what would be your call to action to the people watching and listening? I guess two things. One is don't don't assume that doing it yourself is harder because, you know, in some ways, I don't want to say people have been brainwashed, but, you know, it goes back to the advertising and, and companies that, um, you know, there's things that you can do yourself that are they're surprisingly easy, you know, once you kind of understand the basics of it, you know, and that's that's part of it is just to take that step to figure out what the basics are. And a lot of people are doing that. You know, I see a lot of new canners, you know, lots of questions. And the other thing is that to just even even if it's just the smallest step, like buying a a parsley plant or buying a little oregano plant and putting it in your kitchen, um, you know, it'll build. You know, you just got to start somewhere. And, you know, so many people spend so much time wishing, you know, even if it's no matter what it is, you know, I wish I could change jobs, I wish I could do this, I wish I could do that. Well, you're never going to get there if you don't ever take that first step. So people just have to do that. Um, that's, a, that's a great positive uh, message to take that first step. So um, I want to thank you for giving over your evening and being on with us tonight. It was a wonderful experience, and I, I love hearing you, you discuss your projects. And we'll look forward to more uh, stuff coming out on the blog and the, and the uh, Facebook page. Um, it, you set you know, a wonderful example in the tone and demeanor. And what you offer us this is, you know, so uplifting. So I appreciate it. Thank you so much for being on tonight. Thank you very much, Mark. I really had a good time.
Yep. And I um, want to pass on thanks from the folks in the channel. Uh, everybody's very happy to meet you and well received. And they're all about the homemade soap. Now you have just lit right. the fire on the homemade soap. So. Yep. I should have put a light on. I know I've, I've been getting darker and darker, so I apologize for that. Oh, it's the, <laughs> it's the natural way of things, right? So I hope you have a good evening, and I'll be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye.